Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Resident Smart Learning Program. This is the first academic activity after the new office bearers led by Dr. Ravindra Sabnis, as president of the Urological Society of India, who took over at the Musicon 2022 at Ahmedabad. And this is the regular activity for the postgraduates. And we today have Dr. Apul Goel, the professor of urology from KGMU Lucknow, who will be speaking on stricture balbar urethra. I would now invite Dr. Ravindra Sabnis to give his opening remarks. Over to you, Dr. Sabnis. Thank you, Dr. Keshav. And uh, I'm very happy to uh, <clears throat> announce that we are now on the activities of this year. This is the first uh, webinar activity of, the, of this year. And I'm very uh, pleased to be part of it. As you know, that we were just discussing that uh, virtual conferences, people are very reluctant to uh, attend and uh, join and watch and things like that. But this particular program, which is run uh, last year in a very successful manner, is actually liked by many. The reason is that the topic which are being discussed are of the interest from the exam point of view, from the practice point of view, from the theory point of view. So all these topics are very important. The other important aspect of this program is that the expert in that topic is prepares the, pro, uh, the lecture from every angle and then student gets the ready-made material. So this is a very unique opportunity wherein you have a ready-made material available. You don't have to go here and there, read from here, read from there and then uh, prepare your topic either for the theory or for the practical or for the uh, discussion point of view. You have ready-made material available. I think this is the great um, the benefit of this uh, webinars and the smart learning programs. Probably, although people are reluctant for the uh, virtual activity attending it, but this is a program which is liked by many. And the important aspect is that even though you are busy uh, not watching uh, live on that particular time, these are all recorded and kept in the USI website and in the archive. So anytime you have the list, whichever you want to uh, see, if you see all those programs at, at your leisure time, all your revision will be over because you will be uh, getting all the points which are important. So that is probably the uh, most important benefit of this uh, program. I must congratulate uh, Secretary Dr. Keshamurthy and uh, ISU Chairman Arun Chawla. Now Arun Chawla has also taken over. He has a lot of enthusiasm. He has a lot of dynamism. He has planned lots of th things and activities under the ISU. So he is, this is also his first program. And both of them have chalked out a lot of programs which will be uh, known to you time to time as uh, year passes by. So with this uh, short introduction, uh, enjoy this program. I hand over to Dr. Arun Chawla to give the briefing and then subsequently Dr. Apul Goel, who will be um, uh, giving a talk on this very important and a very relevant talk. Over to you, Dr. Chawla. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for your presidential remarks as well as the opening remarks. Um, as you said, and uh, Honorary Secretary Dr. Keshav Murthy told, this is the first academic meeting after you have taken over, after the new council has taken over. And uh, uh, today's uh, faculty is uh, Dr. Apul Goel, and uh, uh, with the anticipated permission of uh, Dr. Keshav Murthy, um, uh, I have great pleasure in introducing uh, Dr. Apul Goel to all of you. Dr. Apul Goel is uh, currently Professor Department of Urology at KGMC Lucknow. Uh, regarding his uh, qualification, he did his uh, graduation and post-graduation from KGMC Lucknow and then his uh, MCH from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He did his uh, national board examination in, in 2001. He has many awards and honors to his credit, the notable being the USI UA Travel Fellowship for Young Leaders, the Duskon Award and Gold Medal under the ages of Northland Chapter, Urology Society of India, Certificate of Excellence for his uh, professional contribution to patient care, teaching and research by KGMC Lucknow. Uh, he has delivered a prestigious oration, Dr. R. L. Gupta, Subharti oration and S. C. Mishra Memorial oration. He has uh, one patent to his credit, which is uh, regarding a suction bridge. 
Uh, Dr. Apul Goel is currently editor and reviewer for many journals. He is associate editor, Indian Journal of Urology since 2013, and also is a member of editorial board of many journals. Uh, he has many research output, which has earned him uh, five books to his uh, name, uh, ten chapters uh, in various uh, urology books, and more than 190 publication. Uh, Today, he'll be talking about uh, the bulbar uterus structure. And as uh, you have seen in the brochure, uh, he'll be talking about the relevant anatomy, the applied anatomy, the imaging, the interpretation of imaging in relation to the treatment plan, the minimal invasive treatment, uh, as well as the different types of uteroplasty, their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, dear agents, you are all encouraged to put your questions and your queries in the chat box. Um, I'll be just uh, sending a Google form to our honor secretary, Dr. Keshamurthy. He will put in his uh, in this uh, chat section as well as the resident group. Once you get a time, free time, please uh, uh, fill this form. So this will be something like a feedback, how to uh, improve our programs, the upcoming programs in, in this year, in this calendar year. And that will be very helpful for all of us. Uh, uh, with this, I invite Dr. Apul Goyal and, uh, and hand over to Dr. Keshav Murthy also for his any remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Arun. And welcome, Arun, for the ISU USI program. This is the first program under your chairmanship. Arun has taken over from Dr. Rajiv Sood as the chairman of the ISU. And uh, now I invite Dr. Apul Goyal, who will be speaking about Sritcha Balbari Yatra. Over to you, Dr. Apul. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, USI and Indian School of Urology, Dr. Arun Chavla, for asking me to uh, deliver this presentation. Uh, as you can see, this is a very long session. It starts at 7, ends at 8.30, so one and a half hours. So uh, uh, bulbar urethral structure is a vast topic. And as you can see, there are many points that I need to discuss. Example, the urethral anatomy the urethral imaging and its interpretation, minimal invasive management of urethral stricture, and an update on the various types of urethroplasty. Uh, each of these topics are uh, uh, chapters in themselves. They are the big topics. So maybe something I may skip or be a little brief. Some sections, especially the types of urethroplasty, because there are many options today, depending on the site of the structure and other uh, the nature of the structure. So uh, this section is a little detailed. So, but still, in case of any queries, uh, the the students or the faculty they can put it in the chat box, and probably will, if we have time, will try to answer that. I am not sure how to make it interactive. Maybe. I'll take pauses in between when, when I cover each section. And if there are any queries in the chat box, we can take it at that level or in the end. So, uh, so coming to the first section, which is on the anatomy. So if you see uh, um, uh, the coronal section, so the, the urethra, you can divide into posterior urethra, which comprises of the prostatic urethra and the membranous urethra. Then you then what is called the anterior urethra. It has three sections. The one is in the one in the perineum is called the bulbar urethra. The the part of the urethra that is inside the penis is the penile urethra. And there's a in the end there's a dilatation called fossa navicularis, which ends in the urethral meatus. So uh, this section is in the, in the glandular region of the penis. This is in the penis, penile urethra, and this is the bulbous urethra. Uh, you can see this Cooper's gland, which is located embedded in the membranous urethra, but the duct opens into the bulbous urethra. Often you can see this gland and this duct while doing a retrograde urethrogram. So if you see the bulbous urethra is fairly long, so uh, this is a study which is uh, of US males uh, with a mean age of about 55 years. So the length of the urethra, maybe the Indian urethra are, are a little shorter. Uh, it's about 20 to 22 centimeters in length. 
So this is the distribution. Uh, penile urethra is the longest portion, it, which is about 12 centimeters. Then you have the bulbous urethra, which is about seven point, a little shorter than the penile urethra. It's about 7.5 centimeters. Then you have the membranous urethra, which is about 2.5 and the prostatic urethra, which is 3.4 centimeters. This is another view of the perineum, how it looks like. So you can see this is the urinary bladder. The, the part of the urethra traversing the prostate is the prostatic urethra. Then you have the membranous, which traverses the uh, external sphincter. Then you have the bulbous urethra. This is and uh, um, uh, surrounded by uh, the corpus spongiosum. So uh, if you see uh, the anterior urethra is surrounded by the corpus spongiosum. The corpus spongiosum is not there in the membranous urethra and the prostatic urethra. So urethral structure is nothing but spongiofibrosis. If there is fibrosis in the spongiosal tissue, what will happen? The, the urethral lumen will constrict. So, uh, which is known as urethral stricture. So, basically, technically, urethral stricture is a disease of anterior urethra because you don't have a spongiosal tissue in the membranous and the prostatic urethra. So, uh, this is what it is. Uh, this is the pubic symphysis. This is the external anal sphincter, and this is the central tendon. That is often divided while mobilizing the bulbar urethra. And this is engulfed by the corpus spongiosum, uh, bulbo spongiosus muscle. And then you have the coles fascia below that. So uh, as I had mentioned in my uh, initial slide here, there's a copper's gland which opens into the bulbous urethra. So uh, it, uh, it is embedded as I had mentioned in the urogenital diaphragm, but the duct opens in the bulbous urethra. Then there are other glands which are mucin secreting called the litter's gland. And they can also be found in the walls of the bulbous urethra, but typically you see them in the penile or the pendulous urethra. So this is how it is. This is the spongiosal tissue, the corpus spongiosum. This is the lamina propria. This is the mucosal lining. And here is the goblet cells of the glands of litter. Uh, this diagram essentially shows uh, when you uh, do a transaction of the urethra at various levels, for example, this is the bulbar urethra. So you can see because the corpus cavernosa, they separate here. They, they go towards the uh, pubic, um, uh, superior pubic ramus. So uh, these are the corpus cavernosa. Uh, cavernosa, this is the corpus spongiosum, and you can see the bulbo spongiosus muscle ventrally. If you divide the urethra, the, the penis here, you can see both the corpora cavernosa and the urethra below. At the level here, you can see uh, glandular tissue and still you can see a portion of corpus cavernosum and the urethra. And if you do it still distally, you just see the, uh, uh, this glandular tissue, basically, which is the terminal end of corpus spongiosum. Okay, so that was regarding a little bit about the relevant anatomy. So uh, when you suspect a patient to be having urethral stricture, so you need to plan. So obtaining an accurate preoperative information about the anatomy of urethral stricture, for example, the number, number of strictures, typically they are one, but you may encounter patients who have more than one urethral stricture. The location and length of each stricture, the etiology and the human diameter of each stricture. I'll request everyone to mute themselves. Uh, often, uh, unknowingly, people uh, keep them keep the mics open. Please mute yourself so there's no disturbance. Uh, okay. So uh, another thing that is important is, uh, apart from the anatomical details that you, that you need to know, for example, the number, location, and all that, you also need to know the functional significance. For example, the normal urethral lumen is about 24 to 30, uh, 24 French, 24, 26 French. Okay. So, uh, but the, the urethra may be narrow, but the symptoms won't appear till the urethral lumen becomes 14 French or maybe 12 French. Okay. So just a narrowing may not be, may not have functional significance. Okay. So this needs to be known when you are planning your therapy. 
Then there's another concept called stricture, whether the patient is having only stricture or often you have heard this term called stricture disease. So, we, so often we say that this is a patient of urethral stricture or, and sometimes you read in the literature that this patient is suffering from urethral stricture disease. So there is a slight difference between the two. So if you, uh, stricture is when the disease is acute onset and you just have a stricture there. So but typically after, uh, after trauma or something, the rest of the urethra is normal. And such structures are typically smaller in size, shorter in length. A stricture disease, they, they, they are typically long, involve broad areas, having varying uh, spongiofibrosis, and they are typically as a result of inflammation and infection rather than trauma. So urethral structure, because they are typically... Uh, urethral structure is uh, typically managed by anastomotic urethroplasty because they are shorter in length, while stricture disease because it's longer and the more urethra, the longer length of urethra is disease. So typically they require substitution urethroplasty. So I'll quickly run you uh, through these slides. They are not really relevant with this talk, but what to just to tell you the difference between what is a stricture and what is a stricture disease. So you may have in stricture disease, the involvement may be more than that in limited to the urethra. So you may see effects, for example, you may see diverticulum in the bladder, you might see reflux uh, into the kidneys, you might visualize the seminal vesicles, the contrast entering into the prostatic ducts, you might see uh, fistulas and sinuses in the scrotum. So this is, you may see even contrast entering into the vast difference. You might see stones. So even um, a, a watering can perineum or a periurethral abscess. So even a uh, malignancy of the urethra because of long standing urethral stricture. So essentially you need to understand what is urethral stricture and what is urethral stricture disease. So what are the objectives of making a diagnosis? So first of all, when a patient comes to us with obstructive voiding symptoms, we need to really diagnose whether the patient is really suffering from a stricture, then the site and the length of a stricture, cause of a stricture, and the extent of disease. As I mentioned, whether it is urethral stricture or whether it is a urethral stricture disease. Apart from the routine evaluation, important investigations include urophlometry, retrograde urethrogram and a maturating urethrogram. I think more important is a retrograde urethrogram. But if you see the literature, they recommend that it, it is ideal to have both. In every patient, it's, it's good to have both the investigations. Then sonography, sonography, both of the KUB region and the urethra. Examining the urinary bladder thickness wall, it gives you some idea how, how old is the obstruction, how cr the chronicity of the obstruction. For example, if the walls are bladder walls are thick, probably the stricture is long standing. You can also do urethrography uh, using a special probes of the urethra, filling the urethra with saline. You fill the urethra with saline and then you can examine the urethra using probes. And it, it tells you because RGU and MCU tells you about the lumen. It doesn't tell you about the spongiosal tissue. So sonography of the urethra tells you about the status of the spongiosal tissue. You can also do MRI, but that's not very popular. Sonography, again, is not very popular, but people who are interested and if they want to know uh, the status of the spongiosal tissue, yes, it tells you. Uh, Again, cystoscopy is also widely recommended if you read standard textbooks uh, about urethral structure. They, they recommend to do cystoscopy in every case. It, it thus identifies, it gives you important information and the best way to do is to use a pedratic cystoscope. Okay, so here is the uroflometry. Uh, this is a typical normal curve. I think all of you must be aware how it looks like. This is the curve that you get in a patient of BPH or, a, or even in, in, in a patient with BPH or bladder neck obstruction. So essentially the bell shape remains, but it is flattened. It, it's a little, uh, the maximum flow rate is less. 
than what you see in a typical Euro, in a typical normal uroflometry. But in a patient of stricture, this is how it is. It's it's flat on the top. So, for example, the maximum flow rate here is only nine point five, but it, it's a flat uh, uroflometry curve. So this is uh, a, a, a hill with a flat top is called a mesa. So Euroflow, uh, Euroflow metry tracings that look like a flat mesa are typical of urethral stricture. So a mesa, as I mentioned, is an isolated flat topped hill with the steep sides. So as I had shown, so this is how it is. So it, it, it's, it's like a mesa hill, you know, flat top. So the reason behind having this type of flow is that a stricture cannot stretch with increasing flow and thus does not give the typical bell-like shape of a normal unobstructed urethra. So as I had mentioned, uh, it's better that you have both RGU and MCU. MCU tells you the functional information about reflux and all that. It also tells you the, it also tells you the proximal extent of the disease. The RGU will tell you the distal extent, MCU will tell you the proximal aspect. So retrograde is more primarily more anatomical while uh, uh, MCU is more functional. It's a functional study. So uh, RGUs in, in teaching institutes are typically performed by the residents. So this is the position that you make of the patient. This is uh, an image taken in uh, my department. And this is the typical film that you that you see in a RGU. I, I'll discuss uh, how to interpret in later slides. So as I had mentioned, you see the patient is in in a quite a lateral position with this with the lower leg flexed. So proper positioning of the patient is vital. If the patient is not placed oblique enough, the stricture length is underestimated. So it's very very important and how you ensure. Uh, the the when you take a film in the oblique position, it should show only one obturator fossa. So uh, I'll show you. For example, this film you you don't see you see the obturator fossa here, but you don't see it here. So this is the correct position. So this film has been taken with the patient in the correct position. Okay. So uh, coming to the MCU or the VCUG as it is called, both both terms are correct. So often it is not possible because you need to fill the bladder and contrast won't enter because the catheter won't go into the bladder. It's easier if the patient is already on a suprapubic catheter on an SPC. You can still fill the bladder with a, fine, with a small infant feeding tube or you can make a direct puncture with a needle in urology setups. You can do that. Residents do it frequently to fill the bladder directly antigradely and then ask the patient to void. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, a film that show, tells you uh, a, on an RGU film what are the various components of the urethra. So in, in a typical RGU film, this is the portion of the pendulous urethra. Then comes the bulbous urethra or the bulbar urethra. Then you have the membranous urethra. And then, of course, is, this is the image. This is the urinary bladder filling up. And this is the contrast going into the posterior urethra. There is a slight indentation here. So the, the, this is not an stricture. This is normal. This is because there is one, uh, this muscle, bulbospongiosis, there, there's a slight constriction caused by this muscle. So this is normal. Don't, don't diagnose it as urethral stricture and unnecessarily operate the patient doing a DVIU. Okay. So how do you identify where is the... Uh, uh, membranous urethra and where is the prostatic urethra. So this is the view. So things, the urethra proximal to it is the prostatic urethra. This is uh, at the at the lower end of the view, uh, the membranous urethra, the, the, uh, the prostatic urethra ends and the membranous urethra starts. The membranous urethra ends at a line. If you draw a line uh, joining the lower border of the obturator fossa, Okay, so if you draw a line between the obturator, the lower border of the obturator fossa, so this is the lower end of the membranous urethra. So the membranous urethra is between here and here. Then you have the bulbous urethra and then the pendulous urethra. So how do you measure length of the stricture? Again, this is 
uh, this is often you know uh, not understood properly for example this structure is not a membranous structure not a very short structure for example if you are intending to do a graft so you have to measure the length from the normal lumen to the normal lumen here so the you will need a graft that is from here till here okay so you calculate the length of the structure from here to here okay measure from the normal urethral lumen diameter to normal lumen to predict the actual length of graft of flap that is needed okay so here to here so this is the length it's not here only the structure is not uh, just like a membrane here the the length the true length of the structure is calculated by measuring the distance between this normal urethra and this again normal urethra okay this point needs to be known so uh, what happens the hard copies that you get are smaller and not actually not of the actual size so what you can do if you want to measure the length so the this this is 2 cm okay so if you want to measure the length because there is no scale here if you want to measure the length so you can estimate uh, by uh, by estimating the the width of the pubic uh, bone as 2 cm okay so ramus is typically 2 cm or if the facility is there you can have a uh, ruler there and you can measure the actual size of the structure so supposing what happens uh, of uh, sometimes if there is a complete obliteration this is A, a retrograde urethrogram where there is cut complete cut off uh, in the penile urethra. You have no idea what is happening here, and often the MCU the patient is unable to void, so there is nothing that is visible here. So uh, this we published in the Indian Journal of Urology. This is a very simple method where you can do an anti-grade cystoscopy, pass a urethral catheter, and fill the urethra with contrast. So anti-grade urethrogram. so again in case the patient doesn't void for example here as, as i mentioned the the bladder was filled but the patient didn't void so you have no idea what is what is the status of the urethra here so what you can do you can give a uh, you can start celodosin which is a fast acting alpha blocker uh, so uh, the patient might pass urine and you can visualize the posterior urethra so again there is uh, an, another paper that we published so uh, it depends the length of the structure might be you know for the same patient it might depend on the degree of pull that you exert while pushing contrast okay so uh, for the same structure the length might differ for example if if you if the penis is not stretched the the length is different but if it is stretched the length length becomes different okay so this also needs to be kept in mind when you are interpreting a urethrogram so in this particular patient what happened you know, we filled the we, we did a rgu where there was a complete cut off we got the patient was on a suprapubic catheter we 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 did a mcu but we were not sure where the what is the status whether the patient is having a structure here as well or not so in such scenarios you can do a bugiogram as well so this is very 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 rarely performed so but in very rare situations you can use this so as i had mentioned you can do uh, uh, ultrasound of the urethra as well you fill the urethra with saline and then you put a transducer to measure the exact length of urethra for example here the the structure seemed to be small but an ultrasound probe directly kept directly over the structure revealed a much longer structure so uh, i can pause here uh, if uh, someone can uh, quickly see uh, what is written in the chat box so i can do that also please fill in the so there there is nothing in the chat box any anything anyone wants to uh, clarify here so we can take a small pause here and otherwise i move ahead okay so uh, i think uh, there is nothing in the chat box so uh, we will move to the uh, treatments so uh, uh so uh, the options are dilatation 
optical internal urethrotomy and astomotic urethroplasty, graft urethroplasty, flap urethroplasty, and isolated in the bulbar stricture, there's very rare occasions where you perform a two-stage surgery. Two-stage surgery is typically performed in a panurethral or a penile-urethral stricture. For an isolated bulbar urethral stricture, it is rare. But yes, if it, it, there's an associated pendulous urethral stricture, then you may need to do a lay open surgery as well. So I'll not discuss this, uh, but yes, I'll uh, uh, discuss the other, other options. Dilatation, of course, I'll not discuss. This is a blind procedure and not routinely recommended. Uh, I think only uh, senior colleagues who, who have the experience of dilating the urethra, probably they are doing may, maybe the younger generation because these dilators are metallic dilators. But yes, occasional there are occasional uh, indications where you can use Teflon dilators or uh, rubber bougies uh, over a guide wire. I'll not go into uh, all those details about dilatation. So I'll come directly to internal urethrotomy. Again, I'll not discuss this in much detail. So uh, one controversy regarding DVIU or optical, in, or optical internal urethrotomy, both terms are used in uh, different institutes, direct vision internal urethrotomy or optical internal urethrotomy. So the issue, one big issue is the site of incision. In my uh, uh, center, we, we give a single incision at the 12 o'clock, but there are concerns that because if the, if the incision is deep, the, the, uh, the knife may enter into the corpus cavernosum and it might lead to erectile dysfunction. It may give rise to significant bleeding. So all those issues are there. So, uh, but don't put it at uh, uh, 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock positions because there you'll surely enter into the corpus cavernosum. So, uh, but my it, in my center, we are giving a single incision at the 12 o'clock position. The success rate reported for OIU is quite heterogeneous. Various studies have reported different results. Uh, the reason being that the, the length of the strictures vary between each study. Some strictures are located in the bulbous urethra, some are in the penile urethra. So uh, that is one reason why the, the, the results are quite heterogeneous in various studies. But uh, mostly uh, it is accepted that it's, it, it's quite low. But it is very popular because the learning curve is short. The, the, uh, the recovery is very fast and uh, uh, it's very, very minimally invasive. So OIU is a very popular method of treating urethral stricture, bulbar urethral, short segment urethral stricture. Uh, but let me tell you there, if, if uh, you do it once and the stricture fails, the success rate of second OIU is likely to be very low. Uh, so the typical indication of... Uh, doing a OIU is strictures located in the bulbous urethra that are shorter, less than 1.5 centimeters and not associated with dense, deep spongiofibrosis. That happens uh, when there's crush injury, straddle injuries. So there's, in, in these patients, there's significant spongiofibrosis. So probably OIU is not suitable here. Uh, and if you have a very short and such type of patient, you can get a reasonable uh, success rate, which is reported to be about 74%. But in, in a mixed population of, uh, of structures with varying lengths, the success rate is fairly low. Okay, so what are the predictors of failure of old knife DVI? So the structure length. So if the structure is longer than uh, one centimeter, the success rate drops precipitously. If it is short structure, as I said in my previous slide as well, the, the, the success rate is much better. It also depends on the structure tightness, the caliber of the structure. So whether the structures are, uh, uh, the size is more or shorter than 15 French in caliber. So the success rate varies. The number of structures, of course, if the numbers are more, uh, the success rate comes down. Uh, again, a very interesting uh, etiology. 
So uh, someone has, uh, one study has identified that idiopathic structure etiology is independent risk factor for failure, but other studies haven't shown this. So this is a little controversial. So uh, this particular study says that <coughs> if the structure is idiopathic, then the chances of failure are higher. Uh, you don't do uh, OIU for penobulbar or penile structures. Do it only for bulbar urethral structures because the success in penile structure is very low. Uh, as I had mentioned, if DVIU fails once, don't do it again because it's likely to fail. And old age at presentation and obesity are independent predictors of failure after DVIU. So th these are things that you need to remember whenever you are subjecting a patient to DVIU or OIU. So how do you improve your results? So the, as I had mentioned, these the results are not that good with DVIU. So how, people have used various maneuvers by which they have reported better results. So this is a recent systematic review that was published in European Urology 21, last uh, a few months back only in October maybe. Uh, this was published uh, where they have done systematic review and they have looked at all the adjuncts that have been used in patients after DVIU, after minimally invasive treatment. So uh, they could identify 26 studies and 13 different adjuncts were identified. Uh, first uh, were the intralesional injections, triamcillinone, prednisolone, mitomycin C, steroid, mitomycin C, and hyaluronidase, triamcillone, mitomycin C, uh, and N-acetylcysteine, uh, platelet-rich plasma. So all these people have, after doing a DVIU, they have injected all these agents into the structured segment with the hope that the results will improve. People have, instead of injecting, they have used intraluminal installation, again, varying uh, molecules have been used, including mitomycin C, hyaluronic acid, taptopril, and all that. Application via lubricated catheter, triamcillone. Application via coated balloon, paclitexel. And enteral application, even orally, you know, orally people have given tamoxifen and deflazocort. So uh, various adjuncts have been used and uh, the met this meta-analysis concluded that adjuncts to minimally invasive treatment of urethral structure disease appear to lower the recurrence rate and are associated with low adjunct specific complication rate. So one advantage is that if you use these adjuncts, the complication rates are not many and it does improve the success. And uh, But all the studies that they included in their in this meta analysis had a very high risk of bias and of all the agents that i mentioned all these agents that i mentioned so mitomycin c had the highest level of evidence so uh, so uh, in case you wish to do a oiu all these adjuncts can be used they they don't have much complications much side effects and they do improve the results a little bit but the problem is there is wide variation in doses uses. So there's no standardization as yet. Some people, the, the doses of various molecules that I had mentioned are quite variable. And there's no standardized administration protocols. The descriptions of the techniques are often poorly reported. So no treatment recommendation can be made on the basis of current literature. So th this is what the, this meta-analysis concluded. Uh, there are n number of papers, you know, uh, basically uh, modifications of optical internal urethrotomy. People have used various types of lasers to cut the urethral structure, and the results essentially are the same as you that you see in after a uh, optical internal urethrotomy. So I'll not go into those details as well. So again, uh, minimally invasive, uh, I have covered. So let me see. Uh, is it okay to do OIU in penile urethra? I think I have answered this. You, you do it only for bulbar urethra. The description of diagnosing urethral structure disease in uh, anti-grade uh, and MCU is described for males. How to interpret MCU in females? So I think this is... Uh, uh, 
I don't have examples here of MCU in females because my uh, talk is primarily on males. So this is a little theoretical. I don't think I'll be able to answer it here. Maybe uh, some other <laughs> presentation or somewhere or in the end, if I have time, we can answer this. Okay. So there, they, these were the uh, uh, queries in the chat box. Okay, so uh, any query you can keep putting on the chat box and uh, once we finish each section, we'll, we'll try to answer those queries at that particular period of time. Okay, so coming to urethroplasty now. Uh, so uh, the, the first thing that comes to our mind is the timing of urethroplasty. So we need to be sure that the structure is stable and no longer contracting. Okay, because what will happen if you if you um, do urethroplasty, the ends, the uh, both the ends, the proximal limit of your structure and the distal limit in a in an anastomotic urethroplasty, your surgery might fail. If you are doing putting in a graft. The, uh, the patient may experience a, 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 a re-stenosis either in the proximal or the distal limit of your, where you are uh, attaching your graft or a flap to the normal urethra. So the, the, the disease needs to be stable. Another thing is that the urethra should not be instrumented for three months before any plant surgery. Always, if, if, if in doubt, and let me tell you, there are few senior uh, colleagues who routinely put a SPC. If they see a longish structure, they put a SPC to really delineate the exact length of the structure. So because it allows resolution of urethral inflammation and allow narrow areas to declare themselves, this is also called, called as urethral rest because you are putting, diverting the urine. So you are giving rest to the urethra. There's another term uh, called ureteral rest. Okay, so in case uh, there's a suspicion of ureteral injury, people place a nephrostomy and divert the urine. So there is, you give rest to the ureter called ureteral rest. Okay, so after a previous failed urethroplasty, wait at least six months before attempting another open repair. And the reason behind all these recommendations is that it allows tissues to soften and become pliable and for the tissue planes to reform. So that is the reason why you want to give rest to the urethra and, you know, you really identify the exact limits of the structure. Okay, there are certain other points that I need to tell you regarding urethroplasty. It is a proper positioning of the patient and padding. So, because urethroplasty uh, is a about a two-hour surgery or maybe a longer surgery, three hours or four hours, uh, depending on the length of the stricture and the location of the stricture. So, adequate padding is important. Another important thing is that uh, often what happens, the, the nurse stands on the back, the, on the, behind the surgeon. So uh, it makes hand, handling, giving the instruments to the surgeon difficult because the, the, the nurse is standing on the back of the, of, the, of the surgeon. So it's better that the nurse has a Mayo stand and she stands in front of the, of the surgeon so that she can easily uh, give the instruments to the surgeon. A headlight uh, helps because often the, the dissection is deep inside the pelvis. So a headlight. Magnification loops, even if the if your eyesight is perfect, if you use loops, your results will improve. Uh, try passing a guide wire, guide wire where possible. If it's an obliterative structure, of course, the guide wire won't pass. But a guide wire, if you are able to maneuver a guide wire inside the urethra, it helps you in identifying the urethral lumen. Use bipolar cautery. And use cystoscope liberally. If anywhere you are in doubt, use a cystoscope. Uh, methylene blue staining is also recommended because what happens if you if you push methylene blue inside the urethra, the normal urethra takes up uh, the dye more, and the structured uh, <coughs> mucosa doesn't take methylene blue, so it looks a little pale. A normal mucosa looks more bluish. And this also helps you in identifying the exact margin of the structure, the exact limits of the structure. 
Now, coming to the first surgery, which is excision and primary anastomosis, there are two philosophies uh, uh, behind this surgery. Number one is bulbar urethra is elastic, so you can stretch it. And the second reason why you can perform the surgery in the bulbar area is that because this point elasticity still remains in the penile urethra. But in penile urethra, you cannot do uh, this surgery. Anastomosis cannot be done because the patient will develop a cordy. Uh, penile curvature. So uh, it's only in the bulbar urethra that you perform the surgery. Uh, one reason, as I mentioned, because it is elastic and can be stretched. Another reason is because the natural, the, the, there's a curve in the bulbar urethra. So you can straighten that. So uh, when you, you excise the diseased portion, so the, the, the bulbar urethra will become straighter. So that is another reason why you can do anastomosis in the in the bulbous urethra. So again, uh, uh, you cannot do the same length stricture for any stricture located in the bulbous urethra. For if the location of the stricture is proximal, so more towards the membranous urethra, so a longer defect can be bridged. But if it is located distally in the, the nearer the bulbo uh, the pino bulbar junction here, number one, then uh, uh, you cannot do an astomotic urethroplasty for longer strictures. You can only do it for shorter strictures. This is a stricture which is more towards the penis. So another thing that you need to remember is don't mobilize this, far, this portion. Just mobilize this portion of the urethra because this is the curved portion with <coughs> elasticity. So don't mobilize the pendular portion of the urethra. Just mobilize this excise this segment and you anastomose. So a typical indications for uh, excision and primary anastomosis is strictures between one to three centimeters. But as I said, shorter strictures, you cannot do EPA for longer strictures, which are located in the distal half of the bulbar urethra. You can only do it when, only when the stricture is towards the proximal portion, okay? So, uh, but this is, uh, uh, so it is, it's always written as one to three centimeters, but you can do maybe, you can cover a three centimeter defect if the structure is located proximally, but only one centimeter if it is located distally. So uh, this is the, these are the steps. You divide the urethra and then anastomose. It has a very high success rate, more than 90%. The problem is that there's acute erectile dysfunction, which may be as high as 53%. But with time, as the time passes, the eventual uh, erectile dysfunction rate is only 5%. So to overcome these problems of erectile dysfunction and also to, uh, to extend the benefit of anastomotic urethroplasty to longer structures, various modifications have been described. So these are certain modifications that each of them I'll be discussing. Vessel sparing EPA, <clears throat> muscle and nerve sparing EPA, non-transacting anastomotic urethroplasty, augmented anastomotic urethroplasty, non-transacting anastomotic, augmented anastomotic urethroplasty. So the names are confusing, but if you give a little time, you'll understand the names are explanatory. They'll, they tell you exactly what you are going to do. So the names are, they, they, they tell you non-transacting. That means the, you are not transacting the urethra, but still you are doing anastomotic urethroplasty. Augmented anastomotic means that you are putting in a graft. Augmenting Augmentation is used for graft or flap. So you are augmenting as well as anastomosing. It is here non-transacting. So you are not transacting augmented that means you are augmenting that means you are putting in a graft anastomotic that means you are anastomosing as well so the names are quite uh, explanatory and uh, then of course vessel sparing and muscle and nerve sparing i think uh, a good uh, urethroplasty surgeon should know about all these techniques and because every patient is different, the location of the stricture is different, the length of the stricture is different. So if he is aware or she is aware of all these techniques, then each technique has certain advantages. And 
in a particular patient, that particular technique can be applied. So uh, number one was the vessel sparing excision and primary anastomosis. This paper, this, this concept has been given by Gerard Jordan uh, because I think most of you must be aware of his name because he contributed to the chapter of urethroplasty in Campbell's urology. I'm not sure whether in the latest edition he is still the author or not, but in the previous many editions, he, he, he authored the chapters on urethroplasty. So, uh, so the, the reason why he described was that uh, whenever we transact the proximal bulbar urethra, the bulbar arteries are transacted. So the distal bulbar urethra then acts as an advancement flag. So basically, when you are anastomosing, you are joining. So uh, basically, the blood supply is coming from the distal end. Okay, because the two ends of the urethra are like... Uh, uh, two flaps when you are joining. So basically it is surviving more on the distal bulbar uh, vessels. So based on the retrograde blood supply through the glands and the penile urethra. So, uh, so what he has done is you separate the urethra here from the triangular ligament. Okay. So the, the bulbar urethra is detached from the triangular ligament and is and is exposed as it exits the bulb to become the membranous urethra. So where it is becoming the membranous urethra, you, uh, you dissect out this area. A posterior plane is developed between the membranous urethra and the bulb through which a vessel loop is placed to retract the bulbar arteries away. So then what he does, he, he creates a space here and retracts the bulbar artery. So he has ensured that the blood supply to the bulb remains and the, this is all he excises. This vascular bulbous portion, uh, the corpus uh, uh, spongiosum is retained. It's not excised. Otherwise, in a typical urethroplasty, what we do is we, we make an incision here, completely transact here. We completely transact here and then join these two ends. So here what he, he says is that you preserve this and you also preserve the bulbar artery. So this is what the, he has done. So uh, you preserve the entire corpus spongiosum and you just anastomose the urethral lumens. Uh, the, the second uh, technique that I had shown in the, in the previous slide was the muscle and nerve sparing bulbar urethroplasty. This, this method has been described by Bar Bagley. So what he tells is, you typically what we do when we are uh, doing surgery of the bulbous urethra, we divide this muscle in the midline. So instead he says, create a plane here and then retract the, the muscle. Don't cut it, just retract it and perform your surgery here. And then the muscle comes back again. And uh, he has shown diagram, this is when you are performing surgery ventrally, but this can also be done if you want to place a dorsal graft. So there are many images in this particular paper and where he has shown how you can do approach the urethra dorsally as well as ventrally. Ventrally is very easy to understand. You, you can see the urethra and you can perform your surgery and then the muscle comes back. Because anatomical study, he says that the anatomical studies have shown that the nerves actually cross. So when you are dividing this muscle, you are cutting the nerves. So uh, <clears throat> when you preserve this muscle, the innervation and the uh, blood supply is retained. So the chances of post void dribbling and ejaculatory dysfunctions are much lesser because the role of this muscle is to help in evacuation of the last portions of the urine the, the terminal part of urination, it squeezes the urethra to push the, the, uh, the, the few last few drops of urine and also the semen. So the uh, contraction, the, the, uh, the integrity of this muscle is important to maintain, uh, to evacuate uh, urine as well as semen. So when you preserve, so this, these two, uh, the, there's lesser incidence of post void dribble and ejaculatory dysfunction. And uh, it is mentioned that you can retract, use this principle to perform EPA as well. If you want to do an astomotic urethroplasty, even then this type of maneuver can be used. Now coming to the third type of urethroplasty that I had shown in the 
in my initial slide so this is known as non transacting anastomotic bulbar urethroplasty okay so it is non transacting as well as anastomotic in the in the if you see here uh, 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 this here you have divided the urethra okay so here you have divided the urethra so it's not non transacting it's transacting okay so in this method it is non transacting so uh, because uh, there is a risk of sexual dysfunction and of other adverse consequences as a result of transaction of the corpus spongiosum so that is the rationale behind this technique and but this technique is only suitable for patients who have a very short stricture and those strictures which are located proximally okay even in the uh, okay it's not mentioned here but it's for proximal strictures so this is uh, the diagrammatic representation so uh, you mobilize the urethra entirely the stricture is uh, located in the proximal portion here so uh, so you give a incision here a dorsal a dorsal urethrotomy is made and then <coughs> this dorsal urethrotomy is stitched transversely so it's effectively a henke mikulix type of stricturoplasty a longitudinal incision that is stitched transversely okay so uh, so you cannot do it here you cannot give a a, a longitudinal incision here and stitch it, it stitch it transversely it can only be done in this portion of the urethra i'll show you so if it is a longish stricture this is more theoretical because uh, vision is not very good here i have tried doing this surgery so it's difficult to visualize the the ventral plate of the urethra so what he says is if 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 the, if this urethra is diseased you excise it then stitch back the healthy mucosa and then close this uh, this uh, uh, urethrotomy which is a vertical urethrotomy transversely okay so uh, if the if the mucosa is not healthy but this is it, it seems more theoretical because it's very difficult to visualize because already it's very proximal urethra that you are dissecting and putting in examining here and then putting stitches it's it looks good in the diagram but in a practical scenario it's very difficult so this is the type of stricture so if you have a stricture here you can give a longitudinal incision close it transversely so this is you can't do it here because they'll be puckering it's not it's not easy to give a longitudinal incision and then stitch it transversely so uh, with this technique the the results with erectile dysfunction are much better so post operative erectile dysfunction is much lesser when you use this technique so this these techniques where you try preserving the vascularity is especially in patients who have issues where you anticipate problems with the vascularity for example elderly patients who have vascular disease peripheral vascular disease atherosclerosis patients who have hypospadias because then the vascular supply from the distal end is is not very good patients who have already undergone urethroplasty before patients who have received radiation therapy there and patients who may be candidates for artificial urinary sphincter because there is always a risk of ischemic necrosis so if the vascularity is already compromised so uh, with all these techniques you are you are taking advantage of the anastomotic urethroplasty with good results but at the same time you are not dividing the urethra completely and geoparadizing you know the bulbar arteries and all those things thereby geoparadizing the vascularity of the urethra so then there is another uh, type of urethroplasty that i had showed uh, shown uh, in the previous slide augmented anastomotic urethroplasty so this it's a anastomotic urethroplasty but at the same time it uses graft uh, because the name is augmented so typically this is a patient where i have performed a augmented anastomotic so you can see it's an obliterative stricture so you have no option you have to do a an anastomotic urethroplasty but the 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 stricture is, is uh, the the distal limit is at the penobulbar junction 
so uh, you are anticipating a longish stricture so uh, so uh, in such scenarios an augmented anastomotic urethroplasty is a good option so you can uh, either uh, put a graft dorsally or ventrally the other end is anastomosed so uh, one end is anastomosed on the other side you put in a graft so uh, uh, for distal type of structures you can put uh, for uh, proximal structures you put the graft ventrally and if the structure is distally in the bulbous urethra you put the graft dorsally and anastomose ventrally okay i hope you have understood uh, here you are anastomosing dorsally putting in a graft ventrally here you are putting the graft dorsally and anastomosing ventrally okay so both the things can be done depends on your preference but typically a stricture which is more distal you prefer to put a dorsal graft and for a stricture that is more proximally you put in a ventral graft now coming to augmented and augmented non transacted anastomotic urethroplasty dr chavla told me to uh, tell you about all these names so that because these names look a little confusing but if you really uh, pay attention then probably you'll understand what what the name suggests uh, is what is typically done so here you are augmenting as well as you are doing anastomosing you are anastomosing but you are not transacting in this you have transacted okay but in this technique you are not transacting the urethra okay so uh, this procedure was developed in response to the observation that most bulbar structures are not associated with full thickness spondyofibrosis so the same concept so uh, you don't want to excise this spondyosal tissue you don't want to excise the spondyosal tissue you just want to confine yourself to the urethra you don't want to sacrifice this spondyosal tissue okay so uh, <clears throat> so uh, this is what is done so uh, you, the uh, here a dorsal urethrotomy for all these techniques you need to do a dorsal urethrotomy first and then assess what type of surgery you are going to do because it is very very difficult to plan these variations pre operatively you it's very very difficult you have to uh, plan it intraoperatively all these procedures so give a dorsal urethrotomy and then take your call which type of urethroplasty you are going to perform if you find a segment which is very narrow so here and here the urethra looks a little better although here the structure is all there here also the structure is there here also but this portion the one which is marked between methylene blue is a portion which is is very very narrow so here they want to do anastomosis so what they have done they have excised this portion of the mucosa but the corpus spongiosum is healthy so they don't want to excise the corpus spongiosum only the diseased mucosa has been excised and then these two ends are anastomosed you understand so this portion has been excised the portion with the very very narrow urethra and then the healthy urethral margins Uh, healthy mucosal margins have been anastomosed okay and then this area remains where you can put in a graft so you have not transacted the urethra number 1 you have done anastomosis number 2 and you have augmented by putting in a graft so that is the name augmented non transacting anastomotic urethroplasty so this as i mentioned you can only plan the surgery intraoperatively depending on what you see when you give a dorsal urethrotomy okay uh so there are certain advantages of transacting versus non transacting if there are any queries at this particular period of time you are most welcome to to ask and i can pause a bit here if you there are two questions are there so yes uh, I, trying to open is, them 
Yeah, Mind is control. MCU must or RGU is sufficient for most of the cases? And the other question is, what is the best time for RGU? Is it necessary to wait till the structure stabilizes? Yes. So uh, most textbooks, as I had mentioned in my slides also, RGU and MCU gives different information. RGU gives you anatomical information and MCU is more of a functional study. So ideally, it is ideal scenario. Yes, you should have both. I have discussed already the problems because uh, you need to fill the bladder and often you send the patient uh, to uh, a radiology clinic where uh, the technician is not doesn't know how to fill the bladder he can't pass the cat catheter into the urinary bladder and if the spc is not there he is unable to do a mcu so but yes as i have mentioned the mcu should be done in each case ideally so but often as i said because mcus if the patient gets investigated outside, then often the MCU is not available to you. And RGU often gives you adequate information. But you have to be careful because the proximal limit of the stricture may not be, may not be evident on RGU alone. And uh, what is the best time for RGU? Typically, we do it because otherwise you will be doing it again and again. So better is to let the stricture stabilize and then do it just before when you are planning to do surgery. Okay. So uh, the uh, if you have an RGU beforehand and you are doing surgery much later, for example, after three months or six months, it's always better to have a repeat investigation, a repeat RGU because the, the structure may have progressed or stabilized and the length of the structure may have changed. Okay. So there's another query, can non-transacting anastomotic augmented urethroplasty be done by ventral approach? Uh, it can be done by ventral approach, but typically the structures are much longer. So you are putting in, because you are putting in a graft, so they are much longer. And although the, the differences, the, the, theoretically the difference between a dorsal and a ventral graft are not significant they are theoretically they they are quite similar as regards results but uh, practically people prefer to put in a dorsal graft so if you are if if the structure is more proximal where the corpus spongiosum is much thicker then you can do it ventrally as well but the problem with ventral urethrotomy again is the 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 corpus spongiosum is much thicker so the bleeding is much more so maybe the vision is so it's a compromise, you know, if you do it, if you, if you, if you are doing it from dorsally, again, the vision may not be that good. Ventrally, it's much better, but because the bleeding in ventral urethrotomy is a little more. So sometimes again, the vision deteriorates, but yes, you can do it ventrally as well. See, uh, there are very few indications of this particular surgery. I have never done this. <laughs> Although uh, I do a lot of urethroplasties, but I have never done this particular approach. And there is, uh, to my knowledge, there are only two papers with only about 20, 25 patients describing this method. Okay. So typically what happens for such type of structures, you just place a graft. You don't do uh, anastomosis inside. You just place a graft and come out. Okay, so they are, they, the literature regarding this technique is not much. Okay, so uh, whatever papers are there, they have done a dorsal approach. In, personally, I have not done this surgery before. So, but I think it can be done both ways. Okay. Uh, oh, are you in bulba urethra at 12 o'clock or 6 o'clock better? I have actually already uh, mentioned this. At my center, we are doing it, doing it at 12 o'clock, but there's a theoretical risk that if the, if the incision is deep, you may enter into corpus cavernosum. Okay, so the risk of bleeding and erectile dysfunction is there. Are there any criteria indications for dorsal and ventral approach? So uh, I think I'll be discussing this a little bit. Uh, 
so uh, i'll maybe i answer this while i'll be presenting those slides so still if the query remains i'll answer that okay so there are certain why people are doing so many things just to just to avoid transacting the urethra and the and the, the whole urethra people are trying to preserve the corpus spongiosum so there are certain advantages of you know, preserving the corpus spongiosum i think the mic of someone is on so there's a little bit of disturbance uh, uh please keep your mics off so there are certain uh, advantages so transacting the urethra allows complete removal of scar tissue reducing the risk of restricture it has a very good long term success rate greater than 95% but may damage vascular supply and is associated with increased sexual dysfunction so these issues look innocuous but as the incidence of cancer prostate is increasing and the more and more people are undergoing radical prostatectomy later on and one complication as we all know of radical prostatectomy is urinary incontinence for which the treatment is artificial urinary sphincter so if you have already divided the urethra once the vascularity is already compromised so the problem is that if you put in a artificial urinary sphincter the erosion rates are much higher so if you conserve the corpus spongiosum then there is a theoretical advantage that subsequently if the patient has to undergo a radical prostatectomy later in life then probably he he'll, he'll be at an advantage uh, the, uh, the for non transacting uh, urethroplasty it prevents complete removal of scar tissue leading to a structure recurrence so you there is a potential that you may leave behind uh, scar so there is a risk of recurrence and of course the success rate with uh, non transacting urethroplasty is never more than 85% and it deteriorates further with time but this preserves the urethral vasculature and it is associated with less incidence of sexual dysfunction okay so traumatic <clears throat> there are certain is the uh, things that we also need to remember while choosing various types of urethroplasty number one is traumatic bulbar strictures are associated with severe spondyofibrosis in most non traumatic strictures the spondyofibrosis is only superficial with healthy residual overlying spondyosum which should be preserved so if you have a patient who has history of crush injury and then subsequently has formed a stricture so maybe you will have to divide the urethra completely it's it's going to be anastomotic urethroplasty for other types of urethral structures maybe the degree of spondyofibrosis is not that much and you can uh, if you try you can preserve spondy uh, spondyosal tissue and as i had mentioned it's always better to do a your dorsal structurotomy first and then plan what you want to do whether you want to place in a graft alone or you want to excise some segment of uh, diseased mucosa and do a anastomosis inside as well okay so this is mostly intraoperative decision that you need to take okay so someone can unmute uh, himself or herself and tell me whether you like to do a anastomotic urethroplasty here or not quick because there are only 15 minutes left sarav or shruti anybody is there can you unmute and answer his question okay so i'll not waste time because the time is very less now so uh, because it's an obliterative structure uh, <laughs> you, you uh, the best treatment would be an anastomotic urethroplasty but as i as i said when you divide the urethra this is taking its blood supply from proximal and this segment will take its blood supply from the distal end okay so here you see the urethra is not healthy so the the blood supply of this end is likely to be tenuous so there is a risk that if you do an astomotic urethroplasty here it's likely to fail because you, you the the urethra here is not healthy 
okay the lumen is narrow probably there is some bit of spongio fibrosis although anatomically it 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 looks fine but functionally it is not good okay now coming to substitution urethroplasty structure is longer than 2 to 3 cm where anastomosis is not possible you need to do a substitution urethroplasty there are various tissues that that can be used the oral mucosa and different tissues but the time is less so i'll now have to rush through so typically what happens this is this slide is important so typically what happens a stricture typically the lumen is about 5 mm to 1 cm if you see the urethral plate the stricture plate is only 5 mm to a centimeter not more than that so how broad you need to take a flap or a graft so typically the 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 width of the graft should be 2 cm flaps are rarely used i think i don't have time i'll not go into flaps in much detail so essentially the the width of the graft has to be 2 cm because the final eventual outcome you need is a 24 french so you need to create a urethral plate of 30 30 french 3 cm so you need to take at least 2 cm width of the graft okay so the oral mucosa graft you can take from the cheek lip tongue cheek is the most popular it gives you the maximum amount of mucosa lip try to avoid because of its morbidity tongue again is not very popular but at some centers people like it so there are certain advantages i think most of you are aware because this uh, buccal mucosal graft urethroplasty is discussed at many forums and also the time is less less you can place the grafts at various places it could be a ventral onlay a dorsal onlay a dorsal inlay lateral onlay dorsal inlay and ventral onlay i'll be very very fast now ventral onlay it's the simplest it's more for the proximal uh, bulbar urethral structure because here the corpus spongiosum is thicker and it can cover you see the thick corpus spongiosum which can give coverage to the graft so the vascularity will be there as as you go distally this thins out here it is not shown but it thins out so it it's it's difficult to cover the graft if you uh, place a <coughs> ventral graft distally so uh, it's minimal dissection it's much simpler but but because the uh, bulb is much thicker here so there's much uh, is more blood loss and there's a risk of graft saccolation uh, and it could lead to post void dribble and ejaculatory dysfunction dorsal only made popularized by barbagli you need to entirely lift the urethra the entire dors the urethra has to be lifted from corpus cavernosum place a stretch fix a dorsal graft this is a again a onlay and then stretch the ends the edges of the graft with the edges of the urethra the advantages are because the 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 corpus spongiosum here is much thinner so there's less blood loss and there's more structural support so uh, this this technique might be challenging if you are planning to if the structure extends much proximally towards the membranous urethra so it's difficult so this technique was popularized by asopa first described actually <laughs> not popularized he he uh, invented you can say this technique where you give a ventral urethrotomy then give a dorsal urethrotomy create some space here this has been shown much wider but this such a broad space is difficult to create <coughs> stretch the graft dorsally and then close the urethra ventrally so the advantage is that the the vascularity that the urethra gets because in the barbegli technique you are lifting so all the blood supply that is coming from the corpus spongiosum is is disrupted here you are not lifting the urethra so the vascularity remains and you have placed a dorsal inlay this is from you are putting it from inside so it's a dorsal inlay and then you stretch here but the disadvantage is that that two urethrotomies you make a urethrotomy here and a urethrotomy there it takes a little longer and it bleeds from here as well as bleeds from there and the space also is not that broad so uh, this method has been popularized by dr sanjay kulkarni one sided anterior urethroplasty a new dorsal only graft technique where he mobilizes the urethra entirely you know from one side and 
till you reach the other side so that you can place a dorsal graft okay so initially it was sort of a lateral graft but this technique has been modified and you can place a graft if you dissect it well on the other side from one side preserving the vasculature and the nerve supply from the other side you can dissect from this side place a graft dorsally and then stitch it so uh, there is one technique called dorsal inlay and ventral only because the space here is not much so often what happens the graft that you place is not 2 cm it's difficult to place a 2 cm wide uh, graft here so what you do you can place a graft here as well as a graft here when you are stitching the ventral urethra you can place a graft here so this is dorsal inlay so you are putting in a graft from inside which is the inlay and a ventral onlay okay buccal mucosa graft so this is the method you give an incision as in a sopa put a graft inlay dorsally and then put a ventral graft which is a ventral onlay Another important point that I need to highlight is this is very important actually. So often what happens, the you stretch the graft, you pull the graft while you are suturing. So this, if you are stretching the graft, then also put, put the penis into a stretch. So when suturing the flap or graft to the open urethral plate, it is essential to keep both the penis and the substitution material on a stretch. So if you are not stretching, <clears throat> then both the things can be at rest as well. You can don't pull the penis as well as don't stretch the graft. Otherwise, there will be mismatch. <coughs> so this is important. So often I see the graft is a little shorter and the length of the stricture is a little longer. So what happens? They, they just stretch the graft. They, they, the, the stitching is quite in a tension sort of thing. So uh, if you compare the results of anastomotic versus substitution urethroplasty, so the long-term results of anastomotic urethroplasty are much better. So the failure rates are much lower with anastomotic and with much higher with substitution urethroplasty, and you know, stricture rates. So this is failure rates. And again, the complication with anastomotic urethroplasty are much lesser as compared to substitution urethroplasty. Uh, if the buccal mucosa is not available or has already been harvested before or is unhealthy, you need to be aware of other alternative grafts or if the stricture is too long, you know, the buccal mucosa is inadequate to cover such a long length stricture, you need to be aware of other alternative methods. Number one is lingual graft, uh, easy to harvest. All the properties that you have with the buccal graft is there with the lingual graft as well. You can take it from both sides and it will give you a length of about 16 centimeters. You take it from both the sides, from this side as well as the other side. And the uh, immediate for the initial two weeks, there's functional impairment, for example, difficulty in speaking or eating, but long-term sequelae are similar to what you see after buccal graft. Then you have full thickness genital graft where you use the prepuce if that's available or the, or the distal penile skin. But of course, you don't use it if the patient is having urethral stricture because of lichenosclerosis. Uh, and if the buccal mucosa is unhealthy or not available, then again, you can use the penile skin. Uh, there are many advantages. It's a hairless part and can tolerate moisture. And uh, again, uh, in a meta-analysis, it's an older study. The, the, the success rate between penile skin and buccal graft is almost similar. Uh, again, if even that is not available, you can use post-auricular skin. And uh, the skin is harvested from the lower half of the mastoid part because, of the, because the upper half of the skin is thinner and very difficult to harvest. And it gives you a fairly long segment of the skin. You can use colonic mucosa. Uh, again, a very interesting study, Tunica albuginia urethroplasty. This study comes from India. So instead of putting, if the, if the graft is not available, instead of putting in a graft, you do a dorsal urethrotomy and then stitch the ends, the edges of the urethra to the, to the uh, tunica albuginia. Okay. So just give a urethrotomy and stitch the ends at a distance. So the urethra is opened up. 
So uh, you can, uh, in some scenarios, you can use the Tunica vaginalis, especially in uh, Uttar Pradesh where uh, hydrocele is common, you can, the, the, it gives you adequate amount of Tunica vaginalis. So the, basically the, scr the scrotum is, the testis is nearby. And if the oral mucosa is not available, but it's very flimsy, it's very thin. So this can be taken. Uh, Nikhil Khattar is very fond of saphenous vein graft. Uh, then you can use flaps, but it requires expertise. They are especially indicated in the penile urethra. The success rate of both grafts and uh, flaps are similar, and but there's high morbidity associated with flaps. So flaps are not very popular. Flaps are essentially uh, based on uh, the uh, DATOS. They are DATOS <coughs> based flaps. Depending on the orientation, you can classify them origin, whether it's taken from proximal penile area or the distal penile area, the vascular blood supply, and whether you use it transversely or longitudinal, whether it's a transverse or a long, or Andy is a longitudinal uh, flap, uh, uh, Mackinac is a transverse flap, and the type of repair, whether you want to uh, use the flap as a tube or a combined tissue transfer or an onlay, so advantages and disadvantages of each method not go into. So Mackinac flap is a transverse flap. So the advantage is that you can take it to the bulbous urethra. Okay. So you can take this. Uh, this is for a pan urethral structure, but if you want to use a flap for bulbous urethra alone, you can use this flap. So there was always a controversy whether flaps are better or uh, grafts are better, but this paper came in 1998. And after this particular paper, the people stopped using flaps practically and grafts became very popular. This study, they showed that the results are similar and the complication rates with grafts are much lesser as compared to flaps. So flaps are difficult to take, grafts are simpler to take, the results are similar, the complications, penile torsion, so many issues are there with flaps. They are difficult to, you need expertise and experience. So uh, flaps are less popular. Thank you so much. So uh, I tried to finish in one and a half hours. So I am stop sharing. And uh, if there are queries, I'll be happy to answer. Although we have tried to answer uh, all the queries that came in the chat box. <clears throat> We have three minutes, so uh, we can uh, have. Lord Keshav. Yeah, that was a very comprehensive coverage of uh, management of stricture, Balbar Uratra, Dr. Apul. Wonderful uh, lecture. I think most of the uh, uh, topics of this surgeries were covered in this talk. Uh, if there are any other questions which are there, I think Kapul is there to answer. Anybody else has any question or Arun, you you, you have any Thank questions? So, yeah, there's one question. Uh, any comment on double face graft? So I had mentioned, you know, the Asopa method where you make a dorsal inlay and a ventral onlay. Okay. So you can, if the, if the lumen is very, very narrow or if uh, you planned to do a, a SOPA method, but the space wasn't adequate. You couldn't place a two centimeter wide graft dorsally. So in that scenario, you can place another graft ventrally. Okay. So a double face graft can be placed. I have described this method for penile structure because what happens in penile urethra, if you are planning to do a SOPA method, the space is not adequate. So I published this paper long back. So I place two graphs, uh, double facing graphs. One more question. Endoscopic, endoscopic urethroplasty and its application. Okay. So and endoscopic urethroplasty, actually I am not very certain i haven't read much about it uh it's uh, it's probably like giving in a, a incision 
a dorsal urethrotomy maybe and putting in a glue and try to pass in a graft endoscopically and fixing it there by a glue so uh, i may be wrong i am i think this is my understanding um, i haven't read much about it if any faculty wants to answer uh, i think they can answer this i think apul you are right uh, it is basically where you are giving incision <clears throat> with the help of catheter you try to arbitrarily position that graft on the side and you 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 make it sure that catheter is placed properly and tugged it so that uh, graft sticks to that place and uh, some sort of uh, imbibition and in, in, in oscillation happens uh, there there is no immobility provided to the graft in the form of suture and all that this raw area and uh, this this uh, this has taken a different form where you are instead of putting a graft you are injecting a liquid buccal cells now uh, the yeah. buccal cells are harvested in suspension so this is something like that now yeah. uh, but this uh, we don't have uh, uh, recommendations or uh, uh, good liter literature in the support of uh, uh, this it was published i think by aims we had one publication from here but after that we didn't see much articles about so there is another query regarding follow up has not been covered you are right so uh, every center has a different because it was not possible you know to cover as i said because some things few things i have just touched upon and uh, uh, because otherwise it's not possible to cover up everything so uh, at my center because uh, i re we remove at four weeks okay so if you want to <laughs> remove after 2 weeks you need to do a peri catheter study there it's a entire presentation that we can take if you uh, wish we can have sort of another presentation on uh, urethroplasty maybe or some aspects of urethroplasty that you want so if you want to remove the catheter of any any time after 2 weeks it's it's preferable to get a peri catheter study so the problem with peri catheter study uh, is that you might introduce infection uh, when while injecting contrast if you are not careful the intra urethral pressures may rise and you it may jeopardize your your anastomosis or suturing so there are many risks so if you intend to remove catheter earlier uh, you need to do a peri catheter study but that has to be done under supervision by a urologist preferably and if there is no leak you can take out the catheter once the catheter is out we call the patient after one month and the general overall worldwide the recommendation is to then call the patient after three months again after three months and then annually so this is the standard recommendation but yes if the patient has symptoms he can always come earlier as well okay so any comment on self calibration post endoscopic procedures <clears throat> again this is a little controversial there is no set recommendation regarding this uh, people who use uh, adjuncts uh, the uh, post dviu uh, with the slide that i showed uh, the meta analysis some people uh, advise steroid clobetasol you know application putting on a catheter and then putting the catheter inside so the uh, so there is less inflammation and less scarring so again but th there is no set recommendation uh, after urethroplasty uh, we don't recommend cic because one one big advantage of doing urethroplasty is actually not to do cic because if you do oiu uh, typically the patient is advised to do self calibration later on okay so uh, after urethroplasty uh, self calibration and all those things are not needed you just operate and just follow up the patient if there are no more questions i think karun your closing remarks yes sir yes sir Uh, uh thank you very much i think uh, uh dr apul has uh, done an excellent job in covering
Uh, yeah, so Apple, uh, uh, an excellent job. Very comprehensive coverage of uh, the bulbar structure. If you see, you have nicely covered from the anatomy, uh, the salient uh, uh, features of anatomy as applied to the euthogram and as applied to the uh, the euthoplasty approach, which uh, one wants to take it after the whole uh, ASU and MCU have been assessed. Uh, you covered minimal invasive treatment of uh, stones and that slide covering the, the systemic reviews of that Christopher Chappell is my favorite uh, uh, slide. It showed all the, uh, what you can say, the management of uh, VIHU with uh, biological modifiers and adjunct treatment uh, uh, that is, uh, a good slide to actually remember and have a look at. Uh, you did cover all the types of euthoplasty in a very nice and diagrammatic uh, way, as well as the operative slides. I think uh, 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 the non-transacting approach, which you uh, emphasized, probably will be clear to the residents, majority of the residents. I did have uh, the video with me, but because of the shortage of time, I, I thought I'll not run it. it. It is three, four minutes video only. But I think the way you emphasized uh, uh, how docile it has to be opened and how the scar has to be excised, how the closure has to be done, um, and you you did cover that how a recent article has come where the ventral approach also in a non transacting can be performed. That is a recent article in, in urology in 2021. Uh, but you have nicely covered the common approaches, the end-to-end, -end, the only techniques, uh, uh, very well with their pros and cons, the ventral approach and the dorsal approach. Uh, you did cover some rare approaches uh, like a monster technique, the, the tunica albuginia, uh, euthoplasty, where you just incise it and just uh, with the suture, you uh, tie it to the tunica albuginia and keep the catheter for three weeks to four weeks uh, and assess it again with the imaging. Uh, uh, because of the shortage of time, some part of the follow-up and some strategies post-op were uh, left because uh, this is a too detailed topic. Uh, what you as a resident has to uh, understand is uh, the basic, the anatomy, how to do the uh, imaging, how to interpret it, the the, the type of uh, strictures of the length, uh, the site, uh, the obliteration, non-obliteration, and the length, how to assess it. He has, with various landmarks, he has uh, described very nicely. And the other thing is um, uh, the basic details about uh, the end-to-end, -end, the substitution. Even if you are not knowing the exact uh, details, but some advantages and disadvantages of the youth of you should be aware of. Uh, for agent, this, this uh, was an excellent and cogent presentation. With this, on behalf of uh, Indian School of Urology and Urology Society of India, I, I thank you for your time which you have given to us today for an excellent presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, residents, for uh, joining us. I think uh, you have to be, uh, we, we encourage you to join in more numbers and uh, stay active during the presentation, interact with the faculty who take time and prepare all these presentations uh, for your classes. With this, I hand over to Dr. Keshamurthy. Thank you, Dr. Arun, and thank you, Apul, on behalf of Urological Society of India for your time. It was a wonderful presentation and I hope all the residents have uh, learned a lot of things about stricture. Thank you. Thank you one and all. And this Saturday we have a master class on erectile dysfunction by none other than Dr. Rupin Shah. So you can log in at seven o'clock. You will get the information from on WhatsApp and the emails. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Apul. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.